Welcome to the Directions Mag Geo Inspirations podcast series with Joseph Kursky. Greetings, everyone. Joseph Kursky here for Geo Inspirations with Directions Magazine. This is a great day because I have here with me today Dr. Paulette Hazier, Geography and Map Division Chief at the Library of Congress. Awesome. Dr. Hazier, welcome. Thank you, Joseph, and thank you for talking to me today. Oh, this is going to be so much fun and so informative to the listener. I spent many, many, many happy hours in libraries uh, growing up, and then on trips now, I often visit public libraries, and I've also been to your geography and map division there at the Library of Congress, so it is a huge thrill to be talking with you today. I think maybe some of the listeners know what your role is, but if you could describe your current position and background, that would be wonderful. So as Joseph mentioned, I am the Chief of Geography and Map Division at the Library of Congress, the world's largest library. Um, as part of being the Chief of a special collection, I am responsible for about 5.5 million cartographic items um, in our holdings. So what does that mean? Um, we, have everything from, um, we have everything from Japanese scrolls to geospatial material, which you would, you would expect and anything in between. So format and material um, does center around geography and cartography, but not necessarily in what you would consider a traditional um, physical uh, tactile map. Um, so there's a lot of 3D objects and um, you know we are responsible for uh, curating the collection, um, stewarding it, making sure that it's uh, available for generations to come. And a lot of it, um, other than the share, usually revolves around us um, providing materials for displays for the library, for um, events that we have. Um, we host a uh, GIS day every year. That's uh, coming up on our 10 year for hosting a GIS day. Um, so we often uh, invite the attendees when it's physical to come into the, to the division and look at the collections. And we also um, were part of uh, the Association of American Geographers conference that was in DC a couple of years back. The Librarian of Congress won a special award and uh, was given to her. Um, and also we had a, before that, we had the Society of Women uh, Geographers uh, we had a one-day conference that we hosted at the library. So we try to also, not only do we do the GIS side of the house, but we also do a little bit more traditional with cartography and geography. My background's a little bit different than what you would expect probably, but um, I came about it in a little, little uh, circuitous manner, I guess, for lack of a better word. I had got my BA in history, and I'm not going to go too far back to when that was, but um, I decided to do my master's degree um, in library science and history. So I did a dual master's degree at the University of North Texas, go scrappy. Um, and <laughs> I decided to go to school there. One of the things that was incredibly interesting to me about the program was it was a combination of working with special formats, um, archival, special collections, as well as doing the traditional, you know, what you would consider the traditional library uh, path. So it was really a, a very... Uh, novel um, program, and it gave it gave the, uh, the it gave the students who were part of the program really a sense of how to um, expand their career choices. Um, so we we weren't limited to just a, a traditional library path. We weren't limited to a traditional archive path, or even a public historian or something of that nature. So I think that that, that flexibility um, really served me well later in my career. So. My first job out of, um, out of library school was actually in the library, but in a special collections. I, I worked at Dallas Public Library in the um, uh, Texas and Dallas History Division. So you would think um, that, would con that would be rare books about Texas and Dallas history, but also a lot of maps, aerial photographies, um, atlases, uh, things of that nature. So a lot of working, that's kind of my beginnings in, um, in cartography. And then we can skip a few more years. And um, when I first moved to the D.C. area, I was working um, for the uh, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, or a lot of you may know it as DARPA. And I was running their, um, their information center. And that's really where I started getting um, exposed to more geography, STEM-related uh, types of research, um, 
working with uh, uh, you know scientists and working with uh, former astronauts, working with uh, uh, you know different people on uh, these these different types of uh, research needs, really kind of again expanded um, my idea of what um, you know what what was out there in the world and what kind of what kind of career I would I would choose to go to. So we'll skip one more time, go over to. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. I know it seems like, boy, all I'm doing is skip. But it does make a path. So you'll, you'll, we'll, make, we'll get to the end. Uh, I, after um, DARPA, I actually worked at the National Ge- Geospatial Intelligence Agency, or form, or known as NGA, because it had to be three letters. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> it doesn't sound right. Um, so when I started working at uh, uh, NGA. My big push was to um, make our uh, holdings, which we had a lot of both geospatial and physical cartographic holdings that we were digitizing, accessible to um, the analysts and the people that we were supporting within the agency. Uh, So that was a big push. um, And so that's really where I started working more more intimately, I guess, with uh, geospatial material. So through my job at NGA, I actually did some work with the Library of Congress. Um, I got to know some of the staff in the library and uh, the chief one day says to me, you know, I'm retiring. (laughs) And I said, that's good, you know, that's glad you're retiring, good for you. He said, that means my job's gonna be open. And I said, okay. So, you know, I thought, why not? You know, I had the background in the geospatial, I had a lot of background in the cartography and I've also worked with the staff um, on my own research as well as uh, research for the different agencies I worked at. So um, I applied in uh, in 2017, so it'll be four years coming up. Um, I began my tenure as the Chief of the Geography and Math Division. Ah, that's wonderful. Thanks for sharing that with us. There are so many things that you mentioned that really resonate with me and I think many of the listeners here. For one thing, I have been involved with GIS Day since yeah, the late Cretaceous, the period when I worked at the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, really since 1999 when it started. So thanks for all your support for GIS Day. We, I and others on this, uh, listening to this, saw you at the AAG just a few years back in D.C., that was one of the highlights is the field trip to the Library of Congress. And of course, we saw you d- at, the, uh, at the conference itself. And uh, another thing was uh, I've taught several d- GIS workshops in Dallas. And I remember, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, I always make it a point to visit the public library when I'm in, you know, on normal travel mode. And I remember the Dallas Public Library, they've got, they've got classical music playing outside of the of the building, you can you can hear it in the in the square that's that's outside the building. I thought that was a really nice a really nice touch. <laughs> the last thing, um, you know, before I go on to another question, though, thanks so much for sharing this. But there is a very vibrant, as I'm sure you are aware, women in GIS geogra- women in geography community. Um, there's a there are several books, and there's a very vibrant community, and so. I know you don't like to toot your own horn, but uh, you are the first female chief of the Geography and Map Division, which apparently was created in 1897. Is that correct? You're right on for both for both of those. Cool. Well, congrats, and that's that's just awesome. And I I also love the way that you you kind of phrased your, hey, the position's open. I've got the background. Why not? You know. So it's it's a good message for the listener to keep keep those goals high and and reach for those goals so anyway lots of good lots of good messages there and we appreciate it what about this dr hazier um is there a specific thing or person that that inspired you to enter the field that you ended up pursuing you know that's interesting and when i went back and thought about that a little bit more i had some really really strong and i will say awesome mentors uh along the way and i i don't know if that there's specifically one person but i you know i do want to give a shout out to a couple of people that i feel um helped me get where i am today um you know i had a really uh strong um uh professor in library school her name was dr samantha hastings and I, you're gonna love this. Um, she was teaching a telecommunications course. So sorry if I date myself a little bit, um, but it was the first time <laughs> about technology and in the intersection of technology and libraries. Mm-hmm. So 
that was kind of a that was kind of an eye opening, you know, and and learned out learned what a hub was and a you know a bus, not the not the thing that you get on with the four wheels, but what a, you know how to right. understand technology. And the great thing about that is that served me so much uh, in my career later as I got more involved in um, you know technology, geospatial, and working with um, IT departments. I could walk. I could walk into the IT department, sit at the table, and actually have a conversation with um, them without um, embarrassing myself too much. Uh, the, the the fun thing about that also is, you know, taking that kind of technology background and then intersecting it with um, my second mentor, which would be um, uh, Dr. Dennis Reinhardt, uh, who was my head of my committee for my dissertation. At, uh, at University of Texas uh, Arlington, you know, he said, you know, you've got that library background, but let's bring also like the idea of looking at maps as not just a, a physical representation, but what meaning can you glean out of maps? You know, what, you know, um, what history mm -hmm. can you find? What devices? And so it was kind of that weird intersection of those two um, mentors that kind of blossomed, when, you know, and one in my dissertation, of course, but later in my career as I started moving into these more uh, technology, library positions, geography, cartography. So um, I would say those would be the two. And of course, my mother, great love of reading. Um, you know, she could not be more happy as I pursued um, more education. So, um, and, and my husband has been very supportive in, in it as well. So I think those those are the people, I don't think there's one person I can identify, but I think this, it's again, I think it's just that intersection of, um, these different influences that kind of made me what I am today. Uh, I love I love these statements. Thanks for sharing those. You touched on uh, mentoring, and there is a vibrant geo mentoring community. Uh, I know that you and others are aware that. But just in case the re the listener is not aware, go to geomentors.net sometime. The I think the geography the GIS community are extremely well number one they've got this earth ethic that they want to do the right thing for people and the planet and then number two they are very generous with their time their expertise you almost never meet anybody in this field that is very uh, oh no i'm not going to share anything with you no it's always how can i help you how can i help you be successful so uh i love that about our community and um it's 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 what i always tell students that you know it's it you're going to remember some projects that you've worked on over your career which you're really going to remember the people and that's so true in in geography and library science and and, and gis isn't it dr hazier i mean it's an extremely generous community you're absolutely correct when you just said about sharing and mentoring um that that's core tenets of, of the library profession as well. Um, we're not about exclusivity. We're not about, um, you know, uh, uh, disenfranchising people. We're all about what can we do to help you? What can, mm -hmm. What's your need mm -hmm. to help you? And, and it's always about what can we do, you know, and it's a we. It, it really is not mm -hmm. just a I. It, it is that kind of collective mindset that that um, drives us. Very good point. In, in, in my work at ESRI, it's supporting educators, uh, faculty, students at all levels, campus facilities, deans, provosts, et cetera, in being successful with uh, applied spatial thinking and geotechnology. And in that work, I encounter libraries frequently. In fact, sometimes, as you probably are aware, they are the focal point for GIS on the campus. And it works out really well because as, as you mentioned, they're about sharing their expertise. They are oftentimes like ge geospatial centers in, in the, in, on the campus. So people come to them for training, for assistance. Uh, oftentimes they host the, the spatial data portal for the campus. And so uh, it, it's been a great uh, thing, not only that, but also to see some of these job positions in higher education that are, hey, we need a geospatial librarian on campus X or campus Y. So growing number of these geospatial librarians and, uh, and I love working with each and every one of them. So very cool, very cool. What project or initiative, it could be plural, are you proudest of being a part? You know, I, when I looked at that, I'm gonna put plural because I think there's some really um, strong projects I've worked on. And so I'm going to go back to my, my time at DARPA. And um, for those of you who don't know this a lot of times, um, scientific communities are not necessarily good about um, keeping their uh, 
internal notes and 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 i know we've had you've had a lot of discussion especially if you've been in academia about internal repositories or institutional repositories or creating you know e-space or different space for um you know for professors who are working on projects to share that information before it you know it either gets published or before you know what have you um darpa was great at doing a lot of this uh research and development but they really weren't great about um having this internal kind of repository so um i am very proud that uh, it, it took us a, a number of years, but we were able to um, stand up a, a, a internal repository for DARPA's tech re technical reports. Um, so it was, uh, it was able, we were able to allow people in the agency to be able to find information about past programs and things that um, other scientists had worked on um, that were in the same area that they were. Um, so again, learning mistakes, lessons learned, things like that. Um, very project management um, type of uh, type of uh, ability to do that. Um, my second one that I would say would be um, I mentioned I worked at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency when I got to um, NGA. Um, they had just finished um, putting out a bid for a new um, integrated library system. Or a lot of times you can, you may remember this called an OPAC or a web mm -hmm. discovery system. It doesn't really matter. But what what does matter is system that they had previously was horrendous for searching for things like maps. Oh my gosh, um, terrible, terrible, terrible. So this was a, a an of a data visualization tool with a more of a traditional uh, library um, type of function. Um, we were given a, a year to stand that up um, because of the way funding goes in the federal agencies and the way the, the um, contract was um, awarded. So uh, we spent a year building from the ground up a system uh, to allow the analysts to better have access to geospatial and uh, cartographic and aerial and, and um, you know, gazetteers and other types of information they needed to do their job. Um, so that would probably be my second one. And then my third one, which hits closer to home and maybe a little bit closer to the listeners, is um, we set up uh, the first cloud-based uh, application in the Library of Congress, which was um, our GIS story maps. So, um, oh we were yeah, the first I've looked at your collection. We were, we were the first one out <laughs> of the park, and it took us a little bit longer than we would have liked. I will be painfully honest. Um, but again, you know, you you have to work with what you have, and you're working, you know, you're working with some constraints because you do work in the federal government, but. Um, we are so proud of um, what we've been able to accomplish, and this um, actually is coming up on our third year, but this is our literally our most successful year because of the pandemic. This has given us opportunities to really expand the program, and uh, in fact, I just sent to uh, John Wortman, who's our representative at mm -hmm. ESRI, and Errol, we just, we just published three more story maps, um, one on the 1918 pandemic, the influenza pandemic, um, another one about uh, Mesoamerican uh, codices, and and a, a third one on, on, a, on another topic. So we have actually seen a huge uptick in interest and um, vibrancy around story maps since the pandemic has started. And um, we will we will probably wind up having already. I know this doesn't probably sound like a lot for a lot of agencies, but we will probably have more than a dozen, if not more, published uh, by the end of the year. And um, this is all about the collections and about topical um, uh, areas of the collection. So it can be anything for, like I said, from uh, you know 15th century books to maps to um, data visual, uh, you know photographs to recordings, to sound recordings. Um, we did a number of them for our American Folklife Center, the, the one before the last three were published, which, which was very close to me because I'm from Chicago, was about jazz and blues, um, the jazz and blues in, in mm -hmm. Chicago and um, the highlight of that in like the 1970s. So it, it, it's been a great opportunity uh, for us. And um, I, 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 am the, I am probably the biggest cheerleader um, on it, and um, we do create some really beautiful um, story maps. So I'm, I'm very pleased with the way that that program has come. In May 2020, 2020, from our story maps team, it was reported that we now have 1.25 million story maps out there. Sure, of varying quality, but 
to your point that people are embracing uh, these multimedia dynamic interactive maps as a means of communicating about what they're passionate about is really amazing. Um, one of my favorites of in your collection is the parallel history of photography and the transcontinental railroad. I think it's called camera and local oh, yeah. something like that. Wonderful. And so I, I salute you. FYI for the listener, we do have openings on our story maps team right now, depending on when you're listening to this, that we probably will still have some, but uh, that team is growing. And uh, as Dr. Hazier said, people are interested in this. People want to expand the capabilities of story maps, which is partly why we're expanding our team. But um, yeah, it is, it is incredibly wonderful as a teaching tool, a research tool, uh, a communications tool, all of the above. So indeed, yeah, I salute you. Um, <laughs> keep up the good work there. Well, you know, and since you mentioned that, and I do want to mention this, because this is one of my, 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 my unexpected, you never know what's going to, where things are going to take you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we decided to start Story Maps for two reasons. One, we knew we had a really good content in our collections that we could we could showcase. And two, um, as, as, and I won't say who said this, but we use it as the gateway drug into GIS. So mm -hmm. um, sure. we, that our, our pitch was to get people interested in using GIS without actually having to know how to do the raster, the raster, the vector and all that. So there was, you know, there was a dual purpose in it, but one of the unexpected outcomes is one of the first story maps we published was on um, the Japanese internment camps. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. the news came out of the Japanese internment camps. And you think, well, that's kind of a downer of a, as a topic, right? That's not really a, um, you know, something that maybe I want to watch or I want to see. Well, honestly, it, it has a lot of to do with hope and, and, and resilience and, and how mm -hmm. people made it through this, this kind of terrible time and still were doing things like they had baseball leagues. They had, you know, they had a lot of, they had churches, they had things. But um, one of the unexpected consequences was uh, one of our staff in the Congressional Research Service uh, reached out to us uh, in, in the library and mentioned that um, she had a friend whose grandmother worked at uh, the, uh, the museum in uh, Los Angeles that does talk about this, um, you know, internment of the Japanese and was so pleased to find out that these, um, these newspapers had been digitized and that they were available and was so just you know, just was just so gratified that that resource was available to her and that she could, you know, encompass that into her, um, you know, her, her, you know, education that she was providing on that topic. So those are the type of things that make what we do really, really special. Um, not knowing where that's going to come from day mm -hmm, to day. Mm -hmm. You just don't know, but you see that and you, you know, you, you, you feel like, wow, we really did hit, hit the mark on this. One of the challenges that we, again, the we term, but face as a geography, geospatial community is touching on what you were saying before. Maps are viewed still largely as these, where is something? They're, they're, they're you know, viewed not as research and not as analytical tools. So that's one of the big hurdles that I and others face in the, in the education side of this is that we're, we're trying to help people view, especially digital maps in a, in a web-based GIS as something that you can analyze your world with and also make wiser decisions for the future, right? Use them as future planning tools. And so that's, that's always been one of the hurdles and then circling around to story maps, yeah, getting people to realize, hey, you know, those, those story maps that you've seen, those infographics that you've seen, those, those interactive maps, even through the COVID dashboards that you've seen and, and people are, are viewing by the, by the millions per hour, those are driven by GIS. And so there are, uh, you know, as, as you were indicating, there are ways you can dip toes into the waters, the shallow waters, and start getting people to view maps differently, but also respect that they love maps and they have maybe since they were kids, you know, like me and you. Um, it, so it, it, is a, it is an interesting world that we're in, and it's, it's a, an exciting time to be in geography and GIS. I mean, it, it's never before, right? People are interested, they are consuming these, these maps, but they're also creating their own through story maps and others. So 
it's a it's an amazing time for sure. Hey, speaking of, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of understated in your hey, we've got yeah, we've got some uh, you know in, in our collection that we could feature in 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 different ways like through story maps, but. It, it, it you're, you're in the, the mother of all collections. I mean, you're, you're in a place that many of us in the, in the community wish, gosh, wouldn't it be great to work at the LOC? I mean, that's sort of like the, the holy grail of, of geography and mapping. Uh, I was just wondering, you probably don't have a typical day or a typical week, but describe some of the stuff that you, that you do in a typical, let's say, month. Well, you can cut this out later, but right now I would say a lot of meetings, but. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> But when we're on site, there's, it's, it's it, you know, it, it's crazily exciting when you're on site. I mean, there's always going to be that administrative things that you have to do. Of course there is. But I mean, the, you know, in a typical month, we could be asked to do a, a tour for a um, another, a fellow agency. So you mentioned USGS mm -hmm. before online, or maybe um, we had NOAA come down and uh, the cartographers, the geographers and cartographers from NOAA came on a visit. Um, what's so interesting about that kind of thing is that we are allowed to, um, we actually work with them to kind of figure out what is of interest to you? What, did, what are the kind of things you want to see? Um, because we have so much in the collection, we can't show you everything, but let's show you what, what makes, um, what resonates with you, what makes, makes it important to you. So we'll be working on maybe doing a number of those types of tours, or we may be doing tours for um, K through 12, or sometimes it's for universities. You mentioned universities, it might be university geography departments that are coming mm -hmm. over with one of their and I know uh, our our, uh, our our cartographer. Um, he went to Marion Washington. He gives back a lot of times and does some um, some you know uh, you know talk, talk talk to an expert kind of day thing. And then we'll have things like um, we'll also have exhibits which um, we have to support for the library. So the exhibit may not be on something that's specifically um, cartographic in nature or geographic in nature, but it might have something to do. Uh, that we will be supporting it. So and a couple of years ago, this is actually a really funny story, because a couple of years ago we had um, a uh, Dr. Hayden, uh, she came in right before I came in, but she decided to do what she called pop-up exhibits. So these are very short time exhibits, not those long, you know, exhibits that are going for months and months, but short time exhibit around mm -hmm. a certain thing and that we would do them for you know like two weekends in a row basically we'd start on a friday and we would do them friday through sunday for two weekends and the theme was spring okay so okay that's kind of nice i guess i mean um so we were like okay so we got geography and math division got weather mm. <laughs> so i'm mm -hmm. like okay. <laughs> All right, that's kind of interesting weather. So um, we've got some old, very old uh, atlases, if you've ever seen them, and you probably have, where they have the, um, you know, the there's there's these figureheads on the cornerstone of each of the atlas, and and they're the wind, and they're wind coming in from different, you know, different, um, you know, north, south, whatever. So we we went that route, but my um, my GIS specialist said, you know. But let's do something. Let's do something like 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 let's like let's shake it up a little bit. So we sat together, and what he did is he pulled 50 years of NOAA data, freely available out there, online. And basically, what he did is he created um, this interactive tornado map. And um, what what he did is he he with different uh, with different uh, levels of uh, you know intensity of the tornado he would show them as uh, you know basically uh, lines on the map and when you drill down because of course we're using GIS and when you drill down even further you could actually get into the neighborhood you mm -hmm. could find out how many deaths there were how much property damage there was um, so we we debuted this at this. Um, We'll just call it Spring Fling. Well, he debuted it at the Spring Pop Up, and the librarian is always really supportive of these um, events. So she came around and she was walking through our area, and I just happened to be there. And she was just so um, amazed by it um, because she was from Southern Illinois, um, you know, not too, a little bit south of where I grew up. And um, she, you know, she was like, oh, I know there was a tornado in 1964 that hit in, you know, near Springfield. And, and we were able to show her that. And so it had some meaning. We had a connection that we, you know, again, those unexpected connections. So that's kind of the things we do, but then we do things like, you know, we, we look at, we look at, um, like I said, GIS day, we look at bigger events, and then we also look at, um, you know, what kind of material can we provide to 
the patrons, um, you know, that'll allow them to do some of these, their own mapping, some of these mashups. So, uh, you know, what, what, what are we scanning? What are we providing online? Um, we just released, and for some folks, this may have meaning, for others, they, it may not. We just released all of our embargoed um, Sanborn maps that we, we had gotten scanned in the last number of years. Our, oh, I love uh, those Sanborn maps. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> so, so we, we now have released every state. Um, of course, we don't have coverage for every year because of copyright, but um, every state is covered in some shape, form, or fashion. And it probably amounts to about um, a million sheets. So wow. we've had a lot mm -hmm. of interest, um, from different folks in the in the uh, different areas uh, in, in academia and, and some other areas that are looking at how can we use that and create something different. So um, th those are those are one, those are some of the things that we do on a on a eh, monthly basis. Sounds good. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. I love those Sanborn maps. I don't know anybody that doesn't. Uh, you've got that incredible detail at the neighborhood level. Oh my goodness! Yeah, what a what a wealth, what a treasure. Uh, another thing that you touched on, I think that was fascinating, is is that you know, on a personal note, uh, when I was when I was in your building, um, f when I was working at USGS doing some research on Swiss topographic methods and uh, the way they do their contouring, and, you know, some of their all of their the Swiss topo service, those maps are beautiful, and I was thinking about incorporating some of those methods into our USGS mapping program. But anyway, your, your colleagues there were so nice to me. And uh, that, was, that was one of my favorite uh, weeks of my whole career is being able to actually work in the, <laughs> it's the Madison building, correct? That is correct. I just can't imagine going there every day for work. That just must be fascinating, but probably probably encounter this kind of thing too. When people think, oh, Joseph, you, you work at NSRI. It must be great to just kind of play around with GIS every day. Hey, uh, Dr. Hazier, it must be great to just kind of, you know, read and look at maps every day. There's, there's, a, lot to, there's a lot to it, right? Um, it, it's, we love what we do, but, uh, but it, it takes effort and um, it takes dedication and, you know, appreciate all that you're sharing here today. How about this? I know we're, we're getting toward the end of the time that we've got here together. So, but I wanted to ask you, you know, given your background and your experience and, and passion for all of this, what do you think we need to work on? We, the community, as, as the, the geospatial geography, education, library science, STEM communities. So what do we need, what do you think we need to be doing in this decade? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting when you think about that, because, you know, you mentioned earlier that I was the first uh, female chief of the uh, geography and map division in, you know, more than 100 years. And, and you're right, I, I, I kind of downplay that. But when I did get the position and I got a lot of um, recognition for that, um, you know, I had a couple of different um, interviews. And, and, you know, one of the one of the things the person said is, you know, don't dismiss that. That does make you unique. And it does it does shape what others think about you. So I, I have to I have to go back to thinking about that, where you say to yourself, it has that the STEM community really embraced diversity and uh, you know not only mm -hmm. women of color but in general. And I do know that there's a strong um, GIS community, uh, women community, but there's a lot still that needs to be done in those areas. Um, I, I have a, a niece who graduated from uh, an engineering school in, in Illinois and, um, you know, about the second year she was in the engineering program, she said, you know, I think I'm going to quit the engineering program. And I'm like, I mean, this, not to be too proud, but this girl was very smart. And I said, well, you know, is it your grades or, you know, is it, you know, is it, you know, you just, it's a lot of pressure and you just, you know, you feel like you might want to do something else. And she said, no, I feel pretty ostracized because I'm a female in that mm. area. And, you know, we keep thinking that there's more and more equitability in these areas that are STEM, but, you know, I think back to my own early career and think, I don't know that I would have went down the STEM route um, early on. And I don't think that it was a matter of I didn't have the smarts or I didn't have the ability to do it. I don't think I was encouraged along those lines. So I think the biggest thing we can do is just really start looking at the makeup of our community and saying, are there pieces of this community that we're missing? Are we not celebrating our individualness, our uniqueness? Are we not um, giving opportunities to these folks? Because that's the thing that just, I think concerns me the most. 
I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for the comments. I'm thinking back on you know my own career. I wasn't really encouraged to be a geographer. This was uh, in the you know the 20th century, but uh, there weren't as many opportunities. But I think even so, now people are still discouraged from pursuing what they're really passionate about, uh, thinking that oh you can't really make that a viable career. Well, as you well know from being in the thick of things, as you have. Um, there are numerous careers that have yet to be invented, right? We, I mean, looking back 10, 10 years ago, did you think we'd have a, a, a storytelling team at Esri, for example? No, no, no. <laughs> That's a job? That's a, that, or, a, or a GIS evangelist or some of these other really creative jobs that are out there nowadays. So that's, that's a good point. And it kind of reflects on what we were talking about earlier. And that is we do have a geo-mentoring community. And so if you are listening to this thinking, you know, how can I do what, what, uh, what Dr. Hazier is doing, for example? Well, you know, again, contact that geo mentoring community and and even folks in your own area that uh, are in GIS or geotechnologies or or you know library science some sort of science that's geo related earth science related or uh, bioscience related there's lots of really interesting jobs out there some of them you have to um, you know do some digging and do your homework and sometimes there's not an actual job posting, but you might find an organization that you're really interested in. And maybe they don't realize they need someone like you with talents that you have. And maybe you need to blaze your own trail. That's kind of a scary thing if there's not an actual job position. But, you know, going into an organization saying, hey, here are the t skills I can bring to your organization. What organization would not want to listen to your proposal of, you know, saving them money, meeting their mission? So, yeah, I like what you're touching on here. Um, what about this? You touched, you, you touched on this a little bit, but advice to a new professional in this field of geography, library science, mapping, science, uh, GIS. What, what, what would be your advice there to those folks? You know, it's interesting. I think, I think one of the biggest things we, we need to remember is don't be discouraged. Um, mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. position you get may not seem like the position that's what you want, but I will say, even from my early career, if I go back to, you know, working in the special collections at Dallas Public, you know, who knew, you know, some years later, and I won't say as many, how many, mm -hmm. that I'd be sort of working in the same situation, but in a broader, you know, bigger environment. So you just never know what that first position out of school is going to provide for you. You don't know maybe the context you're going to make. Um, you know, I spent some time working for a library vendor when I, you know, when I was in DC and, and, you know, I met an awful lot of people because I was training and I was membership coordinator. That wasn't maybe necessarily the job I really wanted, but it was a great opportunity for me a lot of people in the community. So sometimes it's a matter of not being discouraged with the job that you have and not seeing it as a, a, a dead end job or, you know, I can't wait to get to the next one, but seeing what skill sets you can hone in on or what things you can provide. And again, the other thing is, and I think you've mentioned it a lot with the geo mentoring, but volunteer, you know, mm -hmm. um, at the mm -hmm. national up. And uh, you know, even before I worked for the library, I used to go and volunteer. And yes, it's on a Saturday and Sunday, guys. I used to volunteer <laughs> my own, time, but it was a great opportunity for me to meet people in the community. To me, to say, to you know, I often now I will go to conferences and people laugh at laugh and say, you know, there's people who say, "How do you, you know, who are all these people that know you?" And I'm like. I probably trained them at some point in time, or I might have worked with their library, or you know. But you do you do foster that sense of community. You do foster, um, you know, you you get that sense of oh, I get to learn kind of from the outside looking in. What's the good, the bad, and the ugly about being in this? Uh, and and maybe I can find ways to improve that. So I think it's a matter of just don't see that first job as the dead end job, and I can't wait to get out of here. See what you can do to make your skill sets better or expose yourself to different um, areas, maybe in the organization that may um, be helpful later on. And, and like I said, if you got, if you have the time, you know, spend a little time volunteering for some of those organizations that you think may be helpful in your next uh, your career move. Thanks for the wise words. You knew I was gonna ask you this, but <laughs> with the millions of maps and books that you're, that you're um, working with, do you have, you have a favorite that, that that comes to mind. I know it's probably impossible and someone in your position to, to say maybe, but what are your, maybe a few of your favorite maps or books? So, you know, what's really interesting. I, I do get that question a lot. And, you know, sometimes I just say, 
there's no way I could have a favorite and that might be my answer. But actually, I started working in the library more and more. A lot of my favorites are my staff's favorites. It mm. is so fascinating to hear my staff describe some of the materials in the collection because they're very passionate about it. So, you know, I have a, a staff member who is a, a, a huge George Washington fan. So he's, you know, very into George Washington. So we have what's called the L'Enfant plan, you know, the, the you know, L'Enfant who, who is designs eventually what becomes Washington DC. Mm -hmm. um, so right. he, he will take people on tours and he will talk about it and he will show you, he will show you a, a, a survey map, map of what is now known as Alexandria, you know, which is just outside of DC, but where a lot of the um, early colonials has lived. And he will show you that and he will talk to you about what each, each little dot on that means. And then I have another um, person who actually, um, one of her favorite maps is uh, a World War II map that was um, made on a, on a deck of cards. Think about that. Mm -hmm. So a, a map that was built on a deck of cards. So you had cards and you had this map. Um, so um, we just did a we just did a uh, we just did a article in the um, in our uh, Library of Congress magazine, which is uh, available online, and um, it was about uh, you know propaganda maps, um, you know uh, mm -hmm. especially you know the World War II area. So so you know this you know the, you know Japan is you know this big octopus. And, you know, it, I mean, so, pro so we did a whole story about the different maps because um, it was all about World War II. So I think when I talk about my favorite map, it's really, and this is going to be sound very quaint, but it's more about the people. It's how people um, interact with the material and how they get excited about it or they describe it or they want to share their love of it with with other people. And I think that's what makes it my favorite map. It's not necessarily something I, I look at um you know, um, passively, but it's, it, it's something I interact with. And, and I think that's, that's, that's the best part of it. I love it. I saw an article where you were pictured in front of the Waldensee Mueller 1507 world map. That's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. I actually saw that one. It's got to be uh, one of the few besides at the LOC, but it's over at the uh, American Geographical Society Library at UWM campus in Milwaukee, which is another one of my favorite libraries. But uh, yeah, they have some really, they have some really, really strong collections. It, it they've got the von Humboldt 1804. You know, where mm -hmm. he's got his writing up the, his his signature up by Venezuela. I mean, it's just yeah. Um, we could we could go well, on about books we, and maps, couldn't we? Well, it's interesting you mentioned von Humboldt. We actually had an exhibit where we were borrowing our von Humboldt map to be used at for the um, the Smithsonian uh, SAM, the Smithsonian uh, American Library. Um, and fortunately, this all was literally supposed to happen um, just before the pandemic hit. Um, so, um, because th they had uh, another uh, number of other items that they were getting for, uh, to, to, uh, do a whole thing on, on, uh, on Hobo. But, you know, so that's where also, I think that's, that's kind of our, our, uh, outreach to the bigger, broader community is that we do have these, um, exhibits where we actually loan materials and make our materials, um, available as part of a bigger, um, thematic, uh, undertaking so it's just too bad, but they did, um, which was interesting, they did a, a couple of weeks ago, they had a virtual happy hour, a virtual humble happy hour. So um, <laughs> they, they talked to some of the, they talked to some of the folks who curated the exhibit. So it was, you know, it, it was, it was too bad that it didn't, it didn't happen the way we would have liked it happen, but I'm glad they found a way to get something out of it. We in this community are lifelong learners. You get excited about your Von Humboldt happy hour. Uh, and I love it. Uh, it. It just shows people, yeah, be passionate about what you're doing. And then it doesn't seem like work. I mean, sure, we have we have our days, but uh, where where it's frustrating and that we, you know, and so on. But pursue pursue a career where you're not checking to see whether it's quitting time. Uh, that's what I would encourage the listener to do. And by the way, uh, Dr. Hazier, that we had and Andrea Wolf, the person that wrote the Invention of Nature, Alexander von Humboldt's New World at our ESRI user conference uh, three years ago, four years ago-ish. Anyway, I was backstage right before she went out and I said, 
I, I know I, I know after your, your, your presentation on your Von Humboldt book, everybody's going to be wanting to you know, shake your hand and get your autograph and so on. But I just wanted to say I read your book and I love it. And thank you for doing – anyway, so it, that, is, that is one of my favorite books, uh, The Invention of Nature about uh, Von Humboldt. Touching on your, um, your, your statements about uh, Washington, I actually, just in full self-disclosure, dragged family members down to the Great Dismal Sw Swamp one year in the middle of the summer when it was really hot just to see Washington's surveyed canals down there. <laughs> They're incredibly straight because, as many of the listeners know, he was a surveyor and mapper as well as president and general. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much for all of this. Hey, what about this? Um, maybe we could chat uh, in the future about uh, maps, books, but in the meantime, I, I just wish you all the best, all success in your work and uh, you, the, the way you're touching lives and, and whole organizations. Uh, I salute you, and I, I think that everybody listening to this has enormous respect for you and the Library of Congress. I mean, this is truly a, a, a global treasure. It really is. It's beyond a national treasure. It's a global treasure. I would encourage anybody who is you know, thinking about going to D.C. when you're open in normal times to actually visit the collection. I mean, you, you'll probably have to tell people that you're on, you know, uh, on the trip with, uh, come check with me in a few hours because uh, y y once, you, once you go in there, you don't, you don't want to leave. It's just wonderful. So again, saluting you and all the good work that you're doing. I, I, I wish you all the best and thanks for sharing your time with us today. Very much appreciated spending time with you, uh, Dr. Hazier. Well, thank you again, Joseph, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about these important topics. And I, I'd love to talk more. Um, I, anybody who knows me knows I'm not shy about talking. Um, I, I'm definitely not the introvert type. So uh, any anytime I can do that, and anytime we can provide those tours that we are so we would so love to do in person, we'll be happy to um, you know set it up. But right now we're we're working with different ways to provide that information. Well, indeed, you have you you long ago embraced the digital world so that uh, people can access your your holdings uh, uh, in many different forms. I mean, you mentioned story maps and audio and other forms. So uh, again, I salute your your vision on that. And next time I'm in the uh, DC area, I was scheduled to go to George Mason University this semester, but uh, assuming that happens maybe in the spring, maybe I could come over and visit you. That would be that would be a joy. Oh, we love it. And again, I, I think um, I think one of the things that is is, is hardest um, during this pandemic is that I, I know a lot of people don't, as you say, don't feel fat passionate about what they do. And, and, you know, maybe they just say, oh, my job, if I can do it from home, that's fine. Um, my staff has been so eager to get back. Mm -hmm. um, course, but they really miss that interaction with um, our patrons and they really miss working with the collection. So, um, you know, we are, we are, we are very passionate about what we do and we want to have that, that experience back again, where people can, um, you know, see these things in, in person, be able to look at them and take their time. Um, but in the meantime, we'll endeavor until that time comes. And when it does come, um, we're happy to have you back. Uh, many thanks. And thanks again for all of your time today. Much appreciated and uh, all best wishes to you in the future. Thank you, Joseph. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for joining me, Joseph Kursky, on another installment of Geo Inspirations. Today we had the Geography and Map Division Library of Congress Chief, Dr. P thanks for joining us and I wish you a spatial day. <laughs> Thank you.